At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Sunanda Kane, today's speaker. Dr. Kane is Professor of Medicine at Mayo Clinic, and she has contributed numerous reviews and book chapters to the medical, liter to the medical literature, along with over 100 papers of original research. She has edited a pocket guide to the management of IBD and continues to have a busy clinical practice and conducts research in the areas of new therapies, gender-specific issues, and medication adherence. Thank you for being here today, and now I'll turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Caitlin, and thank you for uh, to everybody who's joining us this afternoon. So we're going to do part one of this series today uh, in terms of having IBD can I, can I or can I not have children? And there is commercial support from this for, from an independent educational grant from Forest, from Forest, next. And I am a planning committee member as well as uh, a presenter, and I do not have any direct um, support from Forest, but I do have other disclosures. Next slide. And this is the rest of our faculty and their disclosures. Next slide. So by the end of this presentation, we should be able to understand better uh, and discuss the intersection of inflammatory bowel disease, that I will call IBD, with the menstrual cycle, contraception, and sexuality, be able to counsel female patients with IBD on contraceptive options and the importance of planning a pregnancy, and then also to discuss the management of IBD medications in the context of preconception and in pregnancy. Next slide. So we're going to talk about just a quick overview of inflammatory bowel disease, and then in context, how that overlaps with the menstrual cycle, contraceptive, contraception, sexuality, and then we'll do a case study, and then we'll summarize at the end. So just to remind everybody that part two will be next week, and that's going to address fertility and preconception considerations, pregnancy, and then some... Um, preventative health types of, of topics like cervical cancer, vaccin vaccinations, bone loss, menopause, and some other psychological issues. Next slide. All right, so let's talk briefly about IBD and what it is. Next slide. So just a quick uh, audience poll here. True or false, in the past 50 years, there has been an increased incidence and prevalence of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in the U.S and um, in Europe. True or false? So we'll close the poll. And interestingly, we have a 50-50 split, whether that's true or false. And it turns out the answer is true, that there has been an increased incidence. Caitlin, do you want to? Thank you. Um, so there has been an increased incidence in both of these conditions in the past 50 years, which makes it now 1.5 million people in the U.S. and 2.2 million in, the, in Europe suffer from IBD. The annual incidence of IBD in North America for Crohn's is about 20 people per 100,000, and for ulcerative colitis, it's about the same. The prevalence, because these folks don't die of their condition, is actually at any given time about 320 people per 100,000 population, and for ulcerative colitis, it's about 250. So interestingly, it's um, evenly divided between men and women. Next slide. All right. So um, people ask whether this is a genetic disorder, um, and it's not a genetic disorder in the true sense of what we consider g genetic conditions, but there is a familial occurrence. It's possible, not inevitable, that a child of an IBD adult will inherit the disease. It's, um, the upward risk is about 9%, but as low as 2% if one parent has it. If both parents have IBD, the risk is up to about a third. Again, this is not 100%, not even 50%. So women who are concerned about having children because they have the diagnosis certainly should not be overly concerned that they're going to quote unquote pass this along to their child. There are data that the risk of IBD does increase in first, second, as well as third degree relatives, 
of IBD affected persons. So as clinicians and providers, we do have to think about this in the differential, but certainly it should not play a big role in terms of whether women should be having children or not. And within families, the concordance for the type and location of IBD is quite strong, meaning that if there is a family member with Crohn's disease, that, um, that your patient is likely to have Crohn's disease, that if they have ulcerative colitis, that it's more likely that the family member has ulcerative colitis. Next slide. IBD um, is clinically characterized by certain things. It's a chronic idiopathic disease. Um, with relapsing activation of the immune system within the GI tract, and we'll talk about um, some other parts of the body as well. Crohn's and ulcerative colitis differ in the areas involved and in how it presents. Uh, Crohn's disease characteristically does involve any portion of the GI tract from mouth to anus, and that there are discrete areas of diseased bowel separated by completely normal bowel. The, that Crohn's is predominantly in the small intestine in two-thirds of patients and isolated to the colon in one-third of patients. And in, uh, very importantly, that Crohn's involves all layers of the bowel wall, whereas ulcerative colitis is mucosal or superficial inflammation, always starting in the rectum and extending proximally. So in ulcerative colitis, rather than pain or diarrhea, patients have bloody diarrhea some abdominal cramping, but not as much pain, and then urgency and tenism. Next slide. Next slide, Caitlin. Is this the slide? Okay. Uh, next manifestations of IBD is the next slide. So, well, I do verbally that inflammatory bowel disease. There we go. That um, it it affects both the GI tract, but also other parts of the body, and that it that extraintestinal manifestations can present before, during, or after the IBD diagnosis is made, and that uh, the uh, manifestations are grouped based on association with disease activity. If it's small joint arthritis, oral aphthous ulcers, erythema nodosum, or episcleritis, it turns out that ankylosing spondylitis and uveitis are independent of what's happening in the bowel, as are pyoderma gangrenosum and primary sclerosing cholangitis. And it's interesting that 40% of patients have one or more of these manifestations, and that the mechanism really is unclear. It might be because of genetic influence. There are certain ones that are much more prone to be in women, like uh, erythema nodosum and the arthritis, where men have more risk for primary sclerosis and cholangitis. It's interesting that having had an appendectomy for appendicitis, makes patients less likely to have an extraintestinal manifestation, and that if you smoke, you will have more extraintestinal manifestations if you, have a, if you are a Crohn's uh, patient. Next slide. Caitlin, next slide. There we go. OK, so you can imagine that if you have a chronic inflammation of your GI tract that leads to pain and diarrhea, that you have a significant impact um, on your quality of life, that predominant symptoms um, have a very substantial psychosocial implications, and that a, a recent survey looking at the impact of other chronic conditions um, on IBD quality of life um, really do affect um, general health domains as well as mental health and social functioning, and that bowel symptom severity contributes the most to quality of life. So that, that means, basically, that we have to control symptoms, otherwise the patients are going to be miserable. But IBD also impacts multiple aspects of women's health and specifically their quality of life, including the menstrual cycle that we're going to talk about, contraception and conception. And then um, in the next part two would be fertility, pregnancy, and menopause, but also um, mood, sexuality, and relationships. 
So, um, Caitlin, next slide. So let's move on and talk about IBD in the menstrual cycle and, and how those two interact. So IBD can delay the onset of primary um, menarche in patients who are diagnosed in a, a, during childhood and adolescence that they may not get their period. Menstrual abnormalities um, include, just like in other women, amenorrhea, irregularly, irregular menses, dysmenorrhea, and menorrhagia. So IBD isn't protective, is not protective against these things. Um, the, it's not entirely clear whether they're at increased risk for any of these, but that we do know that hormonal fluctuations can influence GI symptoms. So in turn, what that generally means for the clinicians and the providers is that women with IBD generally experience significantly more diarrhea during their menstrual cycle uh, because of hormonal fluctuations, and thus they may see cyclical patterns to their bowel function. And it's certainly important to consider this alteration and pattern because you don't want to necessarily be treating what you think is a flare if it's really just hormonal variation. Next slide. So um, a recent study looked at the timing of menstrual functional changes relative to an IBD diagnosis. And this was done um, from a population-based cohort. This was all patients from the state of Rhode Island who were diagnosed with Crohn's or colitis. And they were all enrolled within six months of their diagnosis. And retrospectively, menstrual cycle characteristics were examined. And that there were, based on their diagnosis, specific changes in cycle length and duration of flow. And that basically women with baseline dysmenorrhea reported greater intensity of symptoms in the year prior to their IBD diagnosis. So perhaps that this may be a harbinger of the uh, infl inflammatory or autoimmune dysregulation in, the, in their menstrual cycle to potentially give us a clue that they are going to end up with that diagnosis. We have not been able yet to replicate these results but it's very interesting that perhaps menstrual irregularity predates the formal diagnosis of IBD. Next slide. So what do we know about the benefits of our menstrual cycle-driven um, symptoms? There really are not a lot of data. There has been a cross-sectional phone survey looking at women who had Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And this was a fairly sick population where 60% had Crohn's and 30% of the entire population had already had one kind of IBD-related surgery that the vast majority reported using or having used in the past hormonal contraception and that 60% indeed reported cyclical IBD symptoms. And what was found was that there was symptomatic improvement by about 20% of women who were using astroceptives, and almost half if they were using um, a, an IUD, and only 5% noted worsening of their symptoms with oral contraceptives. So the bottom line here is that it does not appear to be harmful to the IBD, but actually may be helpful for those women who suffer from menstrual cyclical variation um, and their GI symptoms. So let's talk about other kinds of contraception. I start with a poll question. The optimal time for a woman with IBD to conceive is when she is steroid free and her disease has been in remission for how long? One to three months, three to six months, six to a year, or one to two years? Okay, so um, we have a 50-50 split again between the answers of three to six months and six months to one year. So. The, the correct answer here is three to six months. Now, there's nothing wrong with waiting six to 12 months. Women with IBD really should be planning a pregnancy, if at all possible, which means that they need to be thinking proactively about their contraception. Conception 
optimally should be when disease has been in remission for at least three, if not six months. And so whoever answered six to 12 was not wrong, uh, but most women don't necessarily want to wait that long feeling well before they start thinking about starting a family. Active disease at the time of conception is associated with recurrent flares in pregnancy, miscarriage, preterm delivery, low birth weights, and other adverse uh, outcomes um, like um, uterine, um, dysfunctional uterine bleeding and gestational diabetes with an unintended pregnancy. Next slide. So the one key question is would you like to become pregnant in the next year? And why is that so key is because if a woman hasn't really thought about it and, she's, and, and she has active disease, then it really is up to us to make sure that she understands that we need to get her disease under control before she tries to actively try to conceive, which means that we should be very proactive about her contraceptive uh, counseling. So next slide. So what do we know about contraceptive utilization among women with IBD? So this was an, uh, there, there are some older studies looking at this that, um, that women in the general population, sorry, that women with IBD use contraceptives at a lower rate than the general population. And that, that might be multifactorial. It may be that women are not counseled. They don't think that they can get pregnant because of their disease, and that's simply not true. So it's certainly multifactorial. In the one study that Dr. Gowan, who is on the uh, planning committee for this um, educational series, did present and publish a couple of years ago, was looking at a uh, uh, population of IBD patients and identifying factors associated with contraceptive use and trying to figure out what they were actually taking and that a good quarter of those patients were on no method at all. Again, probably because of just some ignorance on both the part of the patient and their providers in terms of what their needs were for their, um, for, for their contraceptive health. Next slide. So what do we know about the recommendations? And again, we've already said that the data for oral contraceptives is that they are not harmful and may be helpful for some of those menstrual cycle irregularities and for the symptoms that are driven, that the combined pill, a patch, or a ring, that there really are not too many um, restrictions, but of any of them, these are where the restrictions would, would be, and that the advantages generally have to outweigh the proven risks. However, if you look down this list, that if you look at the copper IUD, um, the other forms of IUDs, um, implants and injections, that really there are no restrictions with these. It is only really with combined pills and progesterone only pills that we um, start to get very concerned about um, advantage and risk. Next slide. So there have been data to suggest that the use of oral contraceptives leads to the development of IBD. However, it's very mixed data, and oral contraceptives are most widely are the most widely used form of contraception in the U.S. And again, in the past, women with IBD had been counseled against taking them, but that the evidence is very conflicting. So next slide. There are actually four studies that are in the published literature. Um, one that was done back in the late 80s, actually by myself and colleagues at the University of Chicago, and we did not find any association between contraceptive use and, and the incidence of Crohn's disease. Then there, was, um, then there have been two meta-analyses on this topic, and there has not been any evidence of an association between use and IBD development. And then there was the, the data from the National Health, Health Study, which is the Nurses' Health Study, which is a prospective cohort study, and a very large N, over 100,000 women in both of these parts. And 
that there actually was a small association between the use of oral contraceptives and ulcerative colitis, not Crohn's disease, and it really did differ according to smoking history. So the overwhelming amount of data does not suggest that there is an increased risk, and if there is, it might be an ulcerative colitis and for those patients who smoke. And why would that be? Because of altered uh, vascular permeability, perhaps, or vascular health, um, the thrombosis that is um, potentiated by that cigarette smoke is the biologic mechanism that we, um, that, that we believe is at work here. So next slide. So there's actually been a prospective nested case control study, and that's the nurse's health study, and that um, looking at uh, measured pre-diagnosis plasma levels of certain hormones, and interestingly, that for women who um, had high pre-diagnostic plasma testosterone levels had a lower risk for Crohn's disease but not ulcerative colitis, and that there was a direct association between sex hormone binding globulin and the development of ulcerative colitis, but there was an inverse relationship between SHBG and Crohn's. So you can see that all of this is sort of all over the place and there's not necessarily consistent data and that we, we have a lot of intriguing information, not necessarily a lot of clinical context here. So what do I tell my patients is that if they need oral contraceptives for treating menstrual irregularity, menstrual-related uh, symptoms, or for con as a contraceptive method, that absolutely they should go ahead and do that, that I'm going to obviously counsel against smoking, and that, um, that I don't anticipate that they would have exacerbations of their disease if they were given that oral contraceptive. There are obviously non-contraceptive benefits to hormonal contraception, including reducing the risk of certain kinds of cancers, and certainly in colorectal cancer, that might be important because inflammatory bowel disease does lead to an increased risk for colorectal cancer because of the chronic inflammation. That patients with IBD are increased risk for bone loss, and you'll hear about that next week. And so we can certainly prevent that by, um, by replacing hormones, and that fibrocystic benign breast disease can also benefit. Acne can be secondary to steroid use, and, and um, oral contraceptives can be used to treat acne, as well as uh, for menstrual migraines, and as we already discussed, the irregular periods and, and dysmenorrhea. In endometriosis, it turns out that there are some early data to suggest that women who have both endometriosis and inflammatory bowel disease actually have more complicated disease to treat and require escalation of therapy more frequently than women who don't have endometriosis. So another reason why hormonal contraception might actually be a good thing. Next slide. All right. So. What is the role of the gastroenterologist and the primary care physician in family planning? Well, so we've already said that if you can ask and document the one key question, that even if you don't feel comfortable trying to uh, prescribe anything, that at least you've opened that door for discussion and then appropriate referral to the person who can help. So women with IBD are often reluctant to discuss family planning with the gastroenterologist or their PCP. They think that this is the role just of, of an OB-GYN, which isn't true. Since 68% or the vast majority of primary care physicians are the ones who have regular contact with their IBD patients and it's not the GI, that it is important that the patient have all sorts of touch points for talking about this and that when it's when there is direct office contact is the time and the opportunity for this discussion. Next slide. So again, some considerations for conception timing is that it's optimal when disease has been in remission for three to six months, and remission means that they are well on a non-steroid therapy. So if you are on steroids and well, that does not count as remission. 
conception is not advised when we are starting new medicines for IBD uh, because, again, you want it to be a stable remission. And again, as I said, that the activity of IBD at conception is what appears to drive and determine the course of disease during that pregnancy. Next slide. All right, so what do we need to address before conception is concomitant medications. The effect of any surgery in the past or if there's a consideration for the need for surgery before getting pregnant. Nutritional needs, so women with IBD can be iron deficient, they can be B12 deficient, they can be folic acid deficient, and certainly those would need to be addressed before contemplating a healthy, normal pregnancy. And then we've already talked about the heritability of the disease, which again is at most 9%, as little as 2%, and so this, that should never be the barrier towards um, talking about conception. So next slide. Let's talk a little bit about sexuality and IBD. Next slide. So we've already said how IBD can have an effect on different aspects of women's life, and certainly that does not exclude sexual well-being. The challenges are physiologic as well as psychosocial. And some of the aspects that can contribute to sexual dysfunction have been well described. And it includes the increased bowel frequency, abdominal pain, incontinence, perianal fistulas, and abscesses that may uh, be in the groin uh, and pelvic area that would make um, intercourse uh, or other kinds of in intimacy just really um, difficult or awkward. Treatment with corticosteroids makes women um, fat and uh, gives them acne and makes them hair suit, so physically unattractive. Surgery leads to stomas and to scars. The pain and chronic fatigue of IBD certainly make it less um, desirable to want to have intercourse. Depression and anxiety also play a role. And then from a pure um, mechanical standpoint, the concomitant arthritis can make it difficult um, to, to engage in intercourse as well. So next slide. So some of the relationship concerns um, we've already touched upon and obviously interplay. So the fatigue that comes with chronic illness or with, the chron with active inflammation or with um, iron deficiency anemia can certainly play a role. The interference of medications with sex life. Now that's not so um, a prominent uh, an issue for women as it could be for men, um, but there are certainly medications that decrease the sex drive, which would be steroids. Painful intercourse because of the deformities and the inflammation around the pelvis around the vaginal area, and then just overall feeling unattractive uh, because of surgical scars or uh, cosmetic reasons from their, from their medications. So next slide. Next slide, Caitlin. All right. So, so we know from the from done in public. Sexual women with IBD and I've been more robust in men, and I don't think that that surprises anybody either. That erectile dysfunction in men is very objective. Their dysfunction is way more complex and difficult to assess. But the one study that is out there that was a survey of 355 IBD patients um, uh, that evaluated the prevalence and predisposing factors for sexual dysfunction. And a full half of women, so 50% in this population, and a third of men found sexual desire satisfaction worsened after their IBD diagnosis. And again, this was a multitude of different factors, and, but certainly uh, that Half of women clearly. Next slide. 
All right, so this is an older study, but um, I think really sets the, sets the tone for what we really do need to do for our patients. This was a case control survey of women with IBD and that most women did report a decreased interest in sex and low sex activity. And what they did was they looked at those scores and subjective feelings during times of active disease. The population um, were, were in remission at the time, and then half of them were had active disease. And that depressed mood actually was the strongest predictor for low sexual functioning scores. So while anatomy and self-image are important, that a depressed mood really does um, drive this increased risk. And you can see here from this uh, from this table um, it did make a difference in terms of feeling attractive. Um, bodily effect, they were actually act or not was about the same whether they had active disease or were in remission as well as if they enjoyed sexual activity if they were sexually active so that if it what that suggests to me is that if women choose to be sexually active they actually do enjoy it but that for those who are depressed um, who are um, who are in um, an active flare are not necessarily engaging in um, sexual activity. Next slide. So I want to just spend um, a minute here um, or two talking about um, some ra not radical but major surgery that occurs in IBD patients, and this is for ulcerative colitis patients who undergo surgery for their disease and have uh, an iliopouch anal anastomosis, where uh, this is a staged procedure uh, that is considered the standard of care, and at the end of all of the stages, there is an internal pouch and no um, ileostomy on the outside of the body. So. Um, the colon is removed and the ileum is formed into a pouch reservoir and that is attached to the anal canal and this is again done in stages and so during the process there is a temporary ileostomy. And why is this so important? Because of it, it takes several surgeries to do and can be quite um, disfiguring in terms of the, the kinds of scars that women can end up with as well as the amount of, of adhesions and scarring that happens within the pelvis and the abdominal cavity. So next slide. So restorative uh, J-pouch uh, procedure can lead to sexual um, dysfunction and dyspareunia and it certainly decreases fertility. In some patients, sexual function may actually improve because they no longer have a disease that they are worried about of fecal incontinence. Uh, there was a case control study that was done um, in women and that they, that they, women did report that they did have, um, following their surgery, an increased bowel frequency, but no significant difference in sexual function. So that um, the, 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 the surgical data do not suggest that this surgery affects um, sexual function to the degree that, um, that we were concerned about. Next slide. So um, what do we do as gastroenterologists? We have to screen for risk factors, and basically that means screening for depression. We have to discuss mobility issues. Can patients move around, um, and would that put them at risk? for not um, being um, able to enjoy or engage in, in um, sexual activity, and then evaluate medications to see whether there was an effect on not just their disease, but on their menstrual cycle, on their uh, ability to um, uh, be aroused and enjoy sex, and also what that's doing through their potential uh, fertility. Next slide. So let's talk about Brianna. She's a 20-year-old G0. She was diagnosed with, in 2007 
with small bowel and colonic Crohn's disease, and she was started on adalimumab in combination with methotrexate and has been on that for four years now, and she is um, doing very well. And she's coming now to discuss contraceptive options as she is planning to initiate um, sexual activity. Next slide. So how would we counsel this patient on becoming sexually active? There's a poll. Number one, encourage her to communicate openly with her partner about her disease and how it might affect her sexual, um, her, her sexual function. Number two, encourage a barrier method regardless of other contraception methods that are used to prevent STIs. Should she use a lubricant such as KY jelly um, or all of the above? All right. And so, great, everybody answered all of the above. Maybe that's test taking skill, but one of the, the reason that we included the um, issue with KY jelly is because some would be concerned that perhaps introducing other entities into the, um, the vaginal vault would potentiate an immune reaction or a flare of disease, and that has not been the case. So um, for sure the answer is all of the above. So what contraceptive methods should you and should you not re recommend for Brianna? And so our choices are the RISM method, IUD, implant or dual protection with a condom and an oral contraceptive pill. And actually the question is, which of the following would not be an option? The rhythm method, IUD, implant or dual protection. Okay, and, oh, interestingly, um, so um, the two-third mission and the IUD not for a, a person answered um, the I. The answer here, um, we would not recommend the rhythm method that an IUD can be used, an implant can be used, and certainly uh, dual, dual method STI would be appropriate as well. So which aspects of her disease may contribute to sexual dysfunction? So fatigue from active flare-up of inflammation, altered body image from steroids, worry over discomfort from need for an urgent bowel movement, or all of the above. And the answer again, as everybody got correctly, was all of the above, because we've, as we've already talked about, that um, that all um, that uh, body image fatigue and uh, worry about the disease activity, i.e., um, having a bowel movement or drainage um, from a perianal fistula, would certainly impair sexual function. So that was the last slide. Um, we've got plenty of time now for questions. And I'm happy to answer them. So Great. while we're waiting for a question, um, I do have one here. So what do I say to a patient who wants to get pregnant but is in the midst of a flare of her disease? So that's a great question. Um, that you know, she may be very concerned that she's getting older, that she wants to have a baby right now, that she doesn't feel, quote unquote, too bad, and that I try to explain to her that actually um, that the disease, active disease and active inflammation are what drive the poor outcomes. And so that when there is um, um, organogenesis, um, that um, that that happens in the first six to eight weeks of um, after conception, and she may not even know that she's pregnant at that point. And that is the active inflammation is going to play a big role in how um, small her baby is, or how um, 
how the placenta and the health will be. So I try to counsel her that it's not a good idea. Other women will come to me and they will say, I felt great when I was pregnant and I'm flaring now and so I want to get pregnant because that's going to treat my disease. And I explain to patients that that's not how it works, that every pregnancy and every child is different and, and, and such that um, there is no guarantee that, um, that this particular pregnancy would go as well as others had. So I highly discourage women from treating their IBD with, a, with getting pregnant. Okay, uh, here's another question. Um, what do I say to a patient who says that she has only been in remission um, and uh, now wants to get pregnant again, and I, and, and I just actually answered that question. But here is another one. Are there lifestyle changes that providers should recommend when a patient is trying to conceive? And that's a great question as well. So I think that it's not any different for a woman with IBD than it would be for uh, uh, any other patient, that certainly um, you want to quit smoking, you want to cut back on alcohol use, you want to make sure that you're getting enough rest, that you are um, of adequate weight. Um, patients with IBD stereotypically used to be thought of as being underweight and skinny, but nowadays with, um, with a third of our population being um, obese or overweight, and I showed you the prevalence data that 1.5 million people have IBD in the country, that a lot of our IBD patients are actually overweight and um, that they are at um, risk for bad outcomes for pregnancy because of their obesity. So lifestyle changes include appropriate weight loss if that is um, indicated and again probably um, a, an assessment of nutritional status and a, 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 a look at their medication list and making sure that they are not on any medications that may impair their fertility or would um, cause an undue harm to a growing fetus. What do we um, what do we recommend is a and if a woman is con considering even considering conception that um, that we recommend that she go on a prenatal vitamin and that would be a, an additional therapy um, that, we would, that we would recommend. Okay, and then um, there's one more question here. Um, is there an increased risk of miscarriage in women with IBD? And that's another good question. So um, that it depends on what study you look at that if you look at the general IBD population in general, that the answer is yes. If you look at ulcerative colitis separate than Crohn's disease, the answer still is yes. But having said that, what are the true drivers for that increased risk is a history of spontaneous um, abortions in the past and active disease and certain medications, particularly high doses of steroids and methotrexate. So that, um, that women in general, if they have uncomplicated IBD that is relatively well controlled, that there is not an increased risk for miscarriage, but there is an increased risk if you have IBD for preterm birth and low for gestational, um, small for gestational age. So again, so low birth weight, um, small for gestational age, and early, um, early delivery, so that they are premature by two to three weeks. Those are the three consistent outcomes in pregnancy, and you'll hear more about this next week when, when, when we talk about pregnancy, um, but not congenital abnormalities, not um, miscarriage and not um, um, and not necessarily an increased risk for um, disease activity if 
your uh, well at the time of conception. So it looks like it looks like there are no other questions in the queue. I've gotten to all of them. So, um, Caitlin, why don't you just show us that last summary slide, and then we'll finish up for the afternoon. So in summary, IBD impacts numerous aspects of women's health and quality of life. That IBD can delay menses from even starting, but also cause menstrual abnormalities that can be effectively treated, just as in the non-IBD population. Optimal contraceptive methods for women with IBD should have a low failure rate and minimal interference with disease. And I showed you that table. And basically, that that's going to include the, the, the copper IUD and some of the estrogen um, pills. Perhaps the combined pills are not as, uh, as um, appropriate a choice. Very important for women with IBD to plan a pregnancy, if at all possible. So ask them that key question, are you thinking of getting pregnant in the next year so that you can have a proactive discussion about that and that you can hopefully time it where disease is in remission for at least three to six months. And that it is essential for gastroenterologists and pr primary care physicians to address relationship issues related to IBD with their patients because the population data have shown that this is actually a very prevalent issue and concern among our patients and isn't adequately getting addressed. So with that, I'll thank you for your time. Um, part two of this webinar series is on the 24th, and that will be presented, co-presented by some of my colleagues also on the committee, and that there are additional webinars available to you online, and that, um, that this webinar is uh, available for um, education, continuing educational credit. And I thank you again for your time. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. We would also like to give another special thanks to our presenter for her excellent overview on this extremely important topic. For more resources, and again, to register for part two, please visit our website at arhp.org. You will be directed to the post-test an hour after. Please take a moment to complete the post-test to receive your continuing education uh, certificate. Please make sure to print your certificate before closing. Thank you again, and we hope that you will join us for another educational session hosted by ARHP.